I spent most of my uh, professional career in uh, Windows. And uh, when transitioning to Linux about uh, three years ago, a lot of cheese moved around. A lot of um, elementary stuff started behaving differently. And a particular pain point was linking and loading. So this is quite literally the talk that I wish I could have watched uh, during that transition uh, three years ago. Um, it, the original title was Everything I Wish They Told Me About Linkers, but it won't be everything, and it won't be just linkers, it will be linkers and loaders. Uh, we will uh, dive into the distinction in a moment. I will narrow it down to shared libs. I will not be discussing, with one small exception, anything about linking static libs. And I will concentrate mostly on the uh, small traps uh, in the different behaviors between Linux and Windows. Um, this is not quite as catchy of a title. Uh, it might be time to rethink this, but um, this is what we have for now. Uh, let it be said also that when I say Linux, I mean pretty much the entire Unix-like operating systems. Uh, okay. My name is Ofek Shilon. I am not a linker developer. I've never uh, authored the linker, so I feel very free, very free to uh, challenge the uh, positions and facts that I'm uh, presenting. And my handle is Ofek Shilon in uh, all major platforms. Okay, let's kick it off with a nano introduction to linkers. Uh, the way the C++ uh, build classically works is you have, you have a bunch of source files. First, the compiler processes them, processes them into object files. Object files are containers for machine code and data and various other meta, metadata. Uh, the small uh, rectangles inside an object code are sections. Uh, the code section uh, is uh, actually called a dot .text section in uh, both Windows and Linux. And there are many sorts of data sections and others, debug sections, exception, uh, handling, uh, whatever. The sections are uh, for consumption by a linker. The first thing that the linker does is unifies all uh, sections with the same name from different object files into a single binary. And uh, after that, after the executable or library uh, is available, uh, when you run the program, the OS loader maps different uh, sections uh, into different segments in memory. This is a small simplification of uh, the real situation. In the real situation, um, different sections, but with matching memory protection requirements, are unified into a single set, into a single segment. That is to say, if uh, a data section has read-write segment and a different section has the same um, required memory permissions, both are uh, typically unified into the same segment. And the segment is mapped to memory on a page uh, aligned boundary, typically 4K. And those mapped pages are um, set with the appropriate uh, memory protection permissions. So sections are for consumption by a linker and segments are for consumption by a load. Uh, now, within a code, let's call it section, many function calls happen. In the most simple situation, uh, these function calls are from the segment into itself. Uh, however, uh, this is where shared libraries enter the picture. A shared library is pretty much an independent and executable. And uh, your own executable can make calls into another shared library. This shared library can make calls into another. So 
these shared libraries uh, both export functions or data, let's call them symbols, for consumption uh, by other binaries, or import data from other libraries to consume themselves. Uh, now, let's take a high-level view of this process. When in a code sec section we have an implementation of a function that uh, contains a, a statement of the form call bar. Uh, this is not the, uh, the way it would look uh, in a binary eventually. Uh, this could eventually take either the form of a direct call, call some known address, or an indirect call, call into the result of some runtime computation. A uh, canonical example is uh, virtual functions, where the contents of this register uh, RAX contain the address of the runtime resolved address of that function. Now, uh, the way this looks in code is that the address of bar, pretty much in both cases, is not known at compile time and mostly in link time too. So the call address is encoded as all zeros but the executable, the binary, does contain a recipe uh, on how to obtain this actual uh, function address. This recipe is stored in an entirely different section, section uh, that holds relocation data. The uh, recipe encoded into the relocation data roughly translates to find the function bar with its fully qualified name and put its address over this string of zeros. That is the first small lie in this presentation. We will uncover the truth uh, in stages. Uh, this can't, you can already see that, that this can't be the full truth because um, this chunk is in a code segment which is read execute, it is not read write. So a different apparatus needs to um, needs to be in place for this call to be actually uh, relocated at load time. Okay. Um, I think it's too early for uh, to take questions. Klaus, are there any questions already? There are no questions yet uh, officially in the chat, but I ask myself, uh, are there any differences already between Linux and Windows, or is it pretty much the same on all operating systems? No, no. By, uh, this high-level view is uh, pretty much uh, always agnostic. We will get to the difference very soon. OK, then please go okay. on. Let's take a deeper dive first into Windows. Uh, a Windows executable contains uh, that typically contains a dot i data section. This is import, the i is for import. Uh, and let's take a bit of a detailed view into its layout. The i data section uh, contains a directory table, which is essentially a list of entries per DLL, per shared library. DLL is the Windows term for shared library. Uh, each entry contains uh, a bunch of data, but uh, what I wanted to emphasize is it contains the DLL name and a, a reference to an import address table. Actually, it contains also a reference to an import lookup table. What this means is uh, an import lookup table is the structure used to search the imported symbols uh, at uh, load time. Uh, essentially, it's a, it's a list of uh, function names and alternatively an index, but typically these are not used. Once uh, the imports were located in this DLL that the directory entry refers to, the 
results of this lookup are stored in the import address table. This is essentially a list of imported function addresses. This is the, these are the results of the resolved function addresses. So schematically, this is the sort of uh, interface that a Windows binary exposes. It exposes one interface for lib1 with a list of the functions to be um, resolved from this library and another interface for lib2 with a list of different functions imported from this library. Uh, let us take the first small detour to discover something that was mysterious to me for many years. What is this um, mechanism called import library in Windows? When you build a Windows DLL, two binaries are uh, formed. Uh, the first is the DLL, DLL1.DLL. Um, this contains uh, the actual implementation of some imported function. And this export stub in the eData section. I, we will not go into the same level of detail into the layout of the eData section, but it seems uh, it behaves pretty much as you would expect. The second binary that is created when you build a shared library in Windows is a static lib, a static import lib, which is meant to be statically linked, that is merged into the executable. After this static linking, this merge of uh, binaries into the executable uh, takes place, uh, a call to the function f in the executable uses this jump stub in, uh, in, imported alongside this import lib. This jump stub import f has a matching entry in the in, in the i data section also merged with the uh, import lib. And so uh, when the loader uh, performs his magic, uh, the executable now contains the instructions to find DLL1, to locate within it imp f, and to uh, write its address into the idata uh, section. So the full route of the call is a call from f is actually uh, routed into this jump thunk into imp f. Imp f has the address resolved by the loader in the i data section, and the execution jumps to the DLL where it goes through another stub into the real implementation. Okay, let's uh, return from this uh, small detour and discuss Linux briefly. Linux has not one, but two sections devoted to um, import symbol information. These two sections are dynamic and then sim. Uh, this is a poor choice of the term, uh, or uh, I'd say very low information content uh, choice of names. But in fact, these are two separate buckets of one with lib names and the other with symbol names. This is a, a dump of dynamic section from a, a, an obj dump of ls. And this is the dinsim section dump from the same executable, the same Linux executable. Uh, so one contains just a list of libraries, the other contains just a list of symbols. So schematically, the interface that Linux exposes is slightly different. It exposes from one section just a list of shared libraries to locate map to the process and the load, and a separate list of functions uh, to locate anywhere in these libraries. 
The same goes for uh, Linux dynamic libraries. Uh, they both expose the same uh, interfaces, a separate list of libraries and a separate list of functions with no um, mapping between them. This, um, this uh, allows slash causes some far, this has far reaching implications on the behavior of Linux and uh, Windows. For one, you can already see that this um, might cause function, if um, lib1 and lib2 export uh, functions with the same name, there is no longer any guarantee that the function would be imported where you intended, where you originally intended it to be imported from. On the other hand, this choice of design is what allows uh, overriding. What allows, as we shall soon see, for example, um, to override a, a function from uh, some library with a different implementation from a different library or from your own executable. A canonical example of such overriding uh, is overriding of new. And uh, this is what enables it. And uh, we'll discuss it soon uh, in more detail. Uh, some words need to be said about um, the search order for a symbol within these libraries. By default, the, uh, the executable is searched before the current lib. If now uh, lib1 exposes a, a list of libs and a list of symbols to be resolved, by default, um, the executable into which this library was loaded, into the whose address space this library was loaded, is searched for these symbols first. And you can intervene in the search order with various uh, switches, environment path, and even uh, ldconfig files. But uh, this we will not discuss any further here. Um, OK, we'll discuss this. Another general. Uh, an often confusing uh, uh, topic to be discussed in, in the Linux universe is position independent code. Um, I was very surprised uh, uh, to learn of its true meaning. What I originally thought that uh, position independent code meant was um, if naively you would implement a call into, from a, say from a code section, from a binary into itself, you could theoretically implement it with a call uh, with direct address. Uh, this, is, this particular code is not position independent. It assumes that the binary was loaded at a particular address. If you would have loaded uh, this binary at a different address, the location of this function would have been different. So, um, sorry. what I thought is that position independent code is something like this. Uh, this form of call, call into an offset from the current um, program counter. This form is position independent. Uh, but this is typically not what happens. This is not what uh, PIC, what position independent code does in Linux. What position independent code does is route the call through a different, uh, through an extra level of indirection. Uh, a call in a PIC mode uh, is routed through a structure called GOT, the Global Offset Table. This is a list of addresses resolved by joint work of the linker and loader. And the call actually contains an offset into the GOT. The reason for this design, um, uh, no, uh, let's get into this a bit earlier. The, the, the right way to uh, read this name, position independent code, is position independent code. <laughs> In this design, the code section is position independent. This doesn't require any 
relocation effort by reloader, but the entire binary is not position independent. The loader does need to locate addresses of uh, called functions and place them at the global offset table. Um, uh, Unix and Linux uh, designers uh, held uh, the goal of position independent code sections in high regard because this is what enables sharing these code pages between processes. Uh, in many aspects, not just in the PIC aspects, I, I'd say the design of Linux shared libs is libc oriented. Uh, I mean to say when your library is shared by uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of processes, then uh, sharing pages is a big deal. This is not the only reason to uh, to split, uh, to, to use shared libraries. Uh, you know, in our previous work, we had um, a very large code base that we uh, subdivided, we partitioned into uh, shared libraries just to parallelize the build and not to rebuild everything uh, on every small uh, change. So, um, so for you, uh, this uh, for application developers, uh, code sharing, uh, page sharing might not be such a big deal. Uh, yeah, I forgot this animation. Okay, uh, note, yes, the GOAT is, a, of course, a writable section, and in this design, uh, the code doesn't have to be. Um, an important uh, emphasis that I want to make is that this, uh, I presented this in the context of uh, external, uh, module external calls. Uh, I said the loader needs to um, locate the addresses of imported functions and put them here, but as a matter of fact, in Linux, um, uh, calls into the uh, binary itself do go through the same route, do go through GOT. Um, this is another necessary factor for being able, able to overload calls. If uh, in this, uh, say, uh, shared library, I'm calling some function that uh, uh, the library does implement, but the executable wants to overload it, I have to, I, I must add this extra level of indirection uh, to give the loader an op opportunity to intervene in the resolution of this call. This is one step closer to the full truth, but this still isn't. And this picture will be refined further very soon. Um, okay, please, uh, uh, another thing to note, uh, we're still in the Linux universe, it is that there is a difference by default between the time of resolution of the symbols between an executable and the shared libraries it uses. Um, by default, when shared libraries are built, uh, uh, there is a switch in effect that is called uh, allowed shlib undefined. So the linker, when you link a shared library, does not check that the dependencies of this library is fulfilled. The reasoning is that in the Linux model, um, these dependencies could be fulfilled by components that are uh, loaded by the executable, but are not visible to the uh, to the linker while linking this library. Uh, this is not the behavior for executables on Linux. In executable, uh, not the default behavior for executables on Linux. Uh, by default, executables are linked with the implicit switch no schlib undefined. So the resolution of the symbols directly imported by the executable 
is checked at link time. Um, now, I actually like the uh, design of Windows uh, better. Um, and turned out while, while researching for this talk that uh, I'm not the only one. This is a quote from Rui Uyama, the author of uh, both LLD and the, uh, I think the latest uh, production ready link, which is MELD. Uh, this design it does provide some flex flexibility, but it is an unfortunate default. Changing it is, uh, is not feasible today. Uh, Mako and P.E. Koff have many problems, but this may be a place where they got it right. This is a place where Windows got the defaults right. Uh, what I don't like about uh, this choice is that uh, it makes it very, very easy to have unintentional circular dependencies. Uh, you can, and I actually did uh, randomly uh, partition your code into shared libs. None of the um, uh, dependencies were checked at build time. And uh, that left me with a tangle of dependencies that is pretty much uh, unresolvable today. Uh, it, it, I prefer the uh, Windows opinionated approach where the environment forces me to invest thought into the layering of the architecture. Um, but both are uh, valid and uh, of course used extensively in production anyway. So what do we have so far about Linux? Uh, Symbol and library dependencies are stored separately in the binary. All calls, well, almost all calls, are indirected through a global offset table. And resolution is deferred to load time. Uh, that is the resolution of library dependencies. Now, here's one implication to uh, C++ developers. Can you form a process-wide singleton? In Linux, it is very easy. You just put it in the executable. Uh, wherever you use it, whether from the executable itself or from uh, dependent libraries, when it will be searched, the executable copy will be the one that will be found. That is not the case in Windows. In Windows, there is no uh, easy solution. There is no... Um, a solution that you can uh, drop in retroactively after the libraries are built. You have to build both your executable and DLLs in advance while uh, aiming for this design. You have to place that uh, process-wide singleton in its own DLL and make sure that all components, all binaries that use that singleton link against that DLL. Uh, we already discussed, in fact, circular dependencies. In Linux, it is, uh, in fact, the default. In Windows, I actually, in preparation of this talk, uh, devised some very ugly hack that uh, would enable it, but um, it's not worth discussing. The, the, the short answer is that you can't have it. And the most important uh, implication uh, to C++ developers that we can already discuss at this stage is, can a shared library function or a symbol uh, more generally, can, be, can it be overridden from an executable? Uh, now, uh, override and overload are um, overloaded terms, uh, heavily overloaded terms. So uh, in linker jargon, uh, the term used is interposition. The, Technically correct phrasing of this question would be, can a shared library symbol be interposed from an executable? In Windows, the short answer is no. In Linux, the short answer is yes, as we discussed. Um, Okay, I think this is a good place to stop for questions. 
Klaus, how are we, how are we doing? So there, there are actually a couple of questions for now. So uh, mm -hmm. first, Stefan made a comment, which might be interesting indeed. Um, so um, Stefan is asking, should melt be actually be mold? Since I don't know the term. Oh, sorry, that's a typo. Of okay. course. All right. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Yes, of course. I'm talking about the linker mold. Yeah, so then this clarifies it perfectly. All right, then CPPEL uh, asks a question, has asked a question a couple of minutes ago. Does Linux have security, security vulnerabilities similar to DLL side loading on Windows? Um, I think, uh, I'm not sure what the term DLL side loading refers to. If, uh, if uh, you refer to the ability to uh, inject DLLs into the process, uh, then yes, this is possible from Linux too, but I'm, I'm not sure this qualifies as a vulnerability since you would have you would need to have the appropriate permissions in the first place. I mean, this is not a privilege escalation issue. In uh, Windows, this is typically done through a, a registry key. In Linux, this is typically done through an um, environment variable through LD preload. We will actually discuss this uh, briefly later. Um, uh, can, can I ask CPPEL if, if that was his intention? Okay, so okay. Um, please, please add another comment if this answered the question or not. Thank you. All right, then um, another question. How would you design slash build a Linux logger object provided slash initialized in shared object lib? Could you repeat that? How would I design a Linux logger that what? That provided initial uh, that is probably provided initialized in a shared object lib. So how, how would you design a Linux logger object that is initialized in a shared object library? Um, I I hope I'm, I understand the question correctly. Are you asking? The way I understand the question is. Uh, can I design a logger that is implemented in a shared object? Yes. Uh, and initialized in a shared object. Uh, yes, I assume if it's initialized there, then uh, it's implemented there. Um, yes. Yes, uh, you can do this, but um, it's, uh, it's actually the same in this case for both Windows and uh, Linux. You would have to make the executable and all other binaries that consume the logger be uh, aware of it. It would need not only to include the relevant headers, the executable in particular uh, would need to link against this DLL. Mm -hmm. uh, in Windows, all consuming, uh, all other consuming libraries, all libraries that want to use this logger would have to link against this uh, logger DLL. In Linux, uh, only the executable would have to link to it as a dependency, and the other satellite uh, SO objects, the, the other Linux uh, shared libraries, uh, could implicitly benefit from uh, the executable linking against it. All right. Okay. I, I think hope that answers the question, but I might have gotten it wrong. Please. Uh, dear uh, Oscar, please write in the comments if uh, I got it wrong. Uh, last then... question for now. Um, so CP Pal uh, uh, was asking also, isn't circular dependencies what export libraries are for on Windows? No. Okay. No. Uh, <laughs> I, I think, please hold this question uh, uh, a few slides uh, further. I will okay. mention uh, export uh, okay. that is the export. Perfect. Plus symbol visibility. So. All right. Okay. I think it's it's good time to move on. Thank you. Okay. So we stopped at the question: Can a shared longer function be uh, interposed from an executable? The canonical example is new, and this is one place where the C++ standard has something to say. Uh, in uh, C++ standard term terminology, these 
uh, interposed functions are called replacement functions. And the exact wording is, a C++ program may provide a definition for uh, any of the following uh, flavors of new and deletes. Aligned and misaligned uh, scalar and array, there's a list of, uh, there's a list of flavors here. And I also say that programs definitions are used instead of the default versions supplied by the implementation. And now we will reiterate on this matter, but from naive re reading, I can already say that on Windows, this is not what happens. If uh, your executable implements new, and the shared libraries, uh, it links again, call new. They call new from the CRT, not from the executable. Okay, let's go to a discussion on the loader. It goes by many names, sometimes called dynamic linker. Uh, in the ELF terminology, it's called interpreter. In a Windows terminology, uh, in particular, it's called an image loader. This is the component that runs in user mode, as it should. Uh, what it does is um, manipulate addresses in user space. And it's not so obvious where it is. In window, uh, where it is and who owns it. In Windows, it is developed as part of the operating system and it is a logical component within the file NTDLA. In Linux, it is not maintained as part of Linux. It is maintained as, it maintained as part of libc. On my personal Ubuntu, uh, this is the location of the file, and it is customizable. Now, let me discuss these points in a bit broader context. Uh, the loader uh, in Linux, it's, let's say, this file. In the MAN pages, it is referred to as LDSO. This is the term that is uh, architecture and OS agnostic. In Windows, these are all the API from NTDLL, which start with LDR. Now, in Windows, NTDLL is the user mode component of um, the operating system. This is the main uh, user mode callable functions uh, into the OS. And so it also includes uh, system call wrappers. Uh, if you come from the Linux world, you might be surprised to find it here because you're used to use uh, to call system functions, system call, to make system calls through libc. Now, if you come from the uh, Linux world, you're used to uh, using libc to make system calls and to make uh, calls into the C API. Malloc, well, malloc does eventually make a system call, but let's say StreamCat is not a system call, and yet it is part of the libc. In Windows, uh, C and actually C++, like, uh, uh, runtime API are implemented in a bunch of DLLs that are collecti collectively called VC redist, redistributable DLLs. Um, now, I'm not sure what is the history behind this. Um, uh, both libc and the loader, LDSO, are maintained as part of, let's say, glibc. Glibc is the canonical implementation of libc. Uh, and th this is an uninform uninformed uh, guess, but, uh, you know, in the early days of Unix, um, a C program and a program were the same thing. Unix and C... Uh, co-evolved pretty much in the same years, in the, uh, mostly in the mind of uh, Dennis Ritchie. And so the C, uh, the C lib, the libc API included uh, uh, 
uh, wrappers, use among wrappers for system calls. Uh, in the days where Windows were des was designed, uh, this was no longer the case. Uh, uh, wrapping system calls uh, is something that any program written in any programming langu language could consume. So this is separate from the C library. Uh, I can't say uh, I have similar uh, justification for the situation with the loader. Uh, the loader is very tightly coupled to the uh, OS. Uh, it, it, is, it is named uh, as a shared library. It, uh, its name is, includes SO and a version, but it is a very special shared library. Uh, it has a special place in Linux. It is, uh, well, first, it's the only shared library that doesn't have, doesn't list other libraries as a dependency, uh, obviously is the only library that doesn't internally list an interpreter. Uh, it cannot have, it cannot be dependent on a loader. Uh, it's actually directly, uh, functions from the loader, both in uh, Linux and in Windows, are the first user mode functions in any new thread. So, uh, uh, so the function names in them are actually hard-coded into the kernel. Um, and I, I don't know the history of the separation, why this is uh, not maintained as part of uh, the OS, as part of Linux. If, if anyone has any insight that uh, he or she wishes to share about it, I'd be very glad to listen. So I did say that it is customizable. If you run a compiler uh, in verbose mode, you'd see among uh, lots of other noise, you see this uh, snippet, dynamic linker, and the name of the loader. Uh, if you would do read elf or uh, dump obj uh, lin a Linux um, elf object, you'd see this information encoded in the interp program header. Uh, this is where the dynamic linker switch uh, is embedded in the binary. And the last thing I want to say directly about uh, loaders is how to trace them in action. In Windows, this is actually a, a slightly hidden uh, uh, option. It, it is, a, a, in fact, a registry key uh, that you can create and use for each uh, application, but I, I hope how to recommend not to do it uh, by hand. Please do it through the G flags, the global flags GUI shipped with the Windows SDK, uh, I mean, alongside the Wind, uh, WinDBG. Uh, type in, in the image file tab, uh, type the name of the executable you wish to trace and check the show loader snaps checkbox. Then start your application from a debugger and you'd be greeted with a very verbose dump of all loader actions and results. This was very useful to me in the past in trying to investigate uh, loader failures. In Linux, this is uh, the, the apparatus is slightly more famous. There is an environment variable called LDDebug. Uh, I actually never used all of its um, focusing, uh, narrower options. I always use LD debug uh, equals all and just grab through the results. But uh, please be aware that if uh, the dump is too verbose, you can certainly narrow it, narrow it down to, uh, to suit your needs. OK, uh, now to discuss lazy binding, which is important for the last implication on C++. Lazy binding. Uh, which is the default on Linux and not the default on Windows, is the practice of um, resolving calls only when they are actually made. That is to say that, that, that there's a slight difference between uh, Windows and Linux. Uh, in Linux, the dependent DLLs are loaded anyway, and just the work of wiring their export into the appropriate calls is done uh, 
lazily. In Windows, even the loading of the libraries is done lazily. And to this end, another level of indirection is introduced. Please recall that uh, when introducing the global offset table, I did say that this is not the full truth. Full truth is that in order to support a delay loading, I'm sorry, lazy binding, this call goes through another indirection, but in a code section. This code section is called PLT. The direct call is made into an offset into the PLT. The code in this PLT slot is first a jump, a jump into the a got slot. If this got slot already contains the address of the function to be called, then this is where the process ends. But initially, it doesn't. Initially, this offset is into a place, uh, it's into the code that resolves this symbol. And as it so happens, this resolution code lies inside the PLT. This PLT slot uh, contains the code needed to make the call into the resolver. This resolver, sorry, this resolver actually overwrites this entry with the proper uh, address of the real function to be called. So after uh, it has done, uh, the LDR resolver has done its uh, action, uh, the true name of the function is dl underscore runtime underscore resolve. And after it has returned, this uh, slot is populated with a final address. This is how a lazy binding is implemented in Linux. I am glossing over some details, uh, but this is as close to the full truth as we'll uh, go to in this presentation. Uh, which makes me wonder, you know, in this, uh, when learning about the PLT, it made me wonder about function pointers. The actual call here is into an address within this binary. If we have two binaries, say an executable and a shared lib, making the call to the same function implemented in a third binary, both calls uh, will not be to the same address. One of them will be to the PLT in the executable, and the other would be into a PLT in the bind in the shared lib. And yet, uh, we can naturally expect that uh, if we take a function pointer into the same function from two. Uh, collaborating uh, binaries, we would have the same pointer. In fact, uh, the C++ standard stepped in and said it explicitly. When you're comparing two pointers, if the pointers both point to the same function, they compare equal. This really seems surprising that it needs to be said, but after learning of the PLT, I, I wasn't sure how can this be achieved. Um, Press something, sorry. Now, um, I actually don't have time to discuss this uh, in any more details. So uh, I will say that um, one of the bits of information that uh, I didn't go into is an extra bit of info uh, in the PLT um, that makes function pointers compare equal. In this case, it's a complicated dance that uh, uh, all uh, linkers, all Linux linkers and loaders and binaries uh, uh, perform together to make this happen. A considerable e effort is taken to make this happen. Uh, the way lazy binding is implemented in Windows is entirely different. Remember, I told you about uh, the directory table in the iData section. Well, there's an entire different uh, table that I didn't tell you about, which is called the delay load directory table, which is very similar, but entirely separate from the regular uh, resolution mechanism. 
Uh, and in Windows, in fact, if you mark the DLL that uh, uh, implements this function as uh, delay load, if you take its address before calling it and you take its address after calling it, you get two different results. Uh, so the same function pointer wouldn't compare uh, equal to itself, much less to the same function pointer taken at different DLLs. Windows, uh, also naively reading with uh, Windows, does not um, uh, conform to this part of the standard. Okay, uh, I need to skip a bit ahead. Uh, I not discuss single visibility, regretfully. Um, I will say this. Uh, for a while, it was very fashionable to discuss, uh, try to measure the overhead of virtual functions. I have a nagging suspicion that most such measure measurements when performed in Linux uh, were done wrong. As we just saw, um, pretty much all function, all calls on uh, Linux, unless, unless you're very particular with your build switches, are indirect calls. Uh, so to isolate the overhead with indirect calls, you'd need more than uh, just to compare virtual and non-virtual calls. Um, if anyone actually uh, did this comparison, then uh, I'm curious to hear of it. Okay, the last thing uh, I'll touch upon is uh, what C++ really has to say about shared libraries. Um, now, before I do, Klaus, are there any questions so far? So there are no new, no new questions. Um, CPPL has added a little bit of explanation about the uh, of the previous question, but I kind of feel that this would be a great discussion in the after talk chat. Yeah, then you can oh, exchange excellent. Excellent. Yes, so much better. Yeah, El, uh, we also discussed a little bit in the chat about the previous logger library. Also great topic for the after talk chat to, to really talk about this in detail. And so uh, please continue. And please also feel free to uh, go beyond the usual 60 minutes. Yeah? We don't have a strict time limit like a, a conference would have. No problem. Ah, OK. So maybe I'll discuss it. Um... Ah, OK. And maybe if uh, someone has to have a single visibility, I'll be to revisit it. OK. Um... This is the same slide uh, I showed earlier with the same snippet from uh, the C++ standard. The program's definitions are used instead of the default versions supplied by the implementation. Now, I did uh, ask around in uh, Discord channels and um, I think uh, Slack of CPP, I tried to gather opinions as to uh, whether I'm reading this wrong uh, or whether Windows is really that in conforming to the standard. Now, the knee-jerk reaction when discussing shared libraries is that it is outside the scope of the C++ standard. And I'm very uncomfortable with this answer. Um, first of all, I don't know what it means. Um, th does that mean that um, any program that uh, is is making use of shared libraries uh, uh, is undefined behavior? Uh, it is not subject to the constraints by the standard um, because that's virtually a hundred percent of C++ programs. Possibly with a few exceptions in the embedded universe, um, all programs link against uh, libc or uh, vc runtime. So th there's a there's a shared library that is ubiquitous. Um, maybe the intention is that uh, 
code inside shared libraries is not subject to C++ standard. Uh, I, I hope, I'm hoping we can do better. Um, now let me share with you my own understanding of uh, the state of affairs. Uh, the spec of the syntax in the C++ standard is entirely mathematically rigorous in the Bacchus now form. So it is um, natural to uh, extend this expectation to the entire document and expect the entire standard to be mathematically rigorous, but it isn't. It is a pragmatic human document. And when reading this clause, uh, the discussions uh, very quickly um, uh, turned into uh, what is a program and what is an implementation. Both terms are not defined in the standards. Uh, does a shared library constitutes its own program? Does an implementation include the loader? Does implementation include the OS? Someone went as far as to say, if, if you go this route, um, you eventually would need that the electric uh, the electric electricity company that uh, supplies the el electrons from for your socket is part of the implementation and that kind of reasoning uh, makes our collective heads hurt um, so i think we need to be pragmatic the state of affairs today is that for example, these two clauses that I quoted, the replacement function and funk pointer comparison clauses, clauses uh, are not fulfilled by Windows if we interpret program and implementation in the natural sense, to, be, to, to say that a program is an executable and all its satellite shared libs, and it will never be. Um, leaving this requirement in the standard uh, would not accomplish anything. Uh, so what I would suggest, I would submit to you that the right, the right direction for the standard to, to, to take, to be able to stop saying that shared libs are just outside the scope of the standard is to drop uh, the clauses that um, are just not fulfilled universally when interpreted uh, to include shared libraries. This is the only pragmatic course of action that I see. Okay, to wrap this up, uh, I, uh, I cut out a lot of stuff. I did not cover relocation details. I did not cover weak linkage, versioning, comdats. There's lots of, uh, actually not so, not so much lots, but there are a few interesting optimizations that the uh, linker can take um, that I decided to leave out. Um, I do list here a ton of resources. I especially recommend uh, Ali Bendersky's blog um, and uh, Ulrich Drepper's paper. It is very well written, very informative. Uh, Ulrich Drepper is one of the implementers of uh, LibC and in particular uh, the loader in Linux. Uh, Michael Kerisk, uh, who until recently was the owner of the entire uh, Linux Man pages uh, holds a specific uh, online training on shared libs in Linux. Um, I, I wasn't able to take it, unfortunately, but Michael was kind enough uh, to go over a draft of this presentation and uh, give some feedback, and I'm very grateful for this. And that's most of what I had to say. That wraps up the presentation. Um, yeah, I think this is a good time uh, to stop. Maybe in the final uh, version, I'll drop visibility section altogether. All right. Thank you very much.
So then, um, let's give people time to ask a couple of final questions. In that time, um, allow me to ask, do you, you, I actually wanted to know about more uh, resources. Yeah, This was a pretty valuable slide, I believe. Yes, uh, is there a way I can share the slides later? Um, Absolutely. Uh, so a lot of options. You can, for instance, post a link to some um, uh, some Dropbox, whatever you, you prefer in the meetup page, uh, the event page. There's an option. We can do the same thing. If you send us a link that you want to, to publish, um, definitely. Uh, please feel free to do so. Okay. Right. There is a question uh, from Andreas. On a modern desktop system, what would be a use case for providing my library as a shared library instead of a static library? Uh, yeah, so the classical use case is um, uh, is indeed to uh, facilitate sharing of the memory consumed uh, by the library between different uh, processes using it. Uh, I would add that another uh, use case is to um, ease your build process. Uh, if you if you develop a library as part of your own application, you typically don't want to rebuild or at least relink the entire application every time something small changes. Uh, so it is a common design choice to separate uh, your application into different binary components. That is to say, different shared libraries. And last but not least. Um, A very common design choice is to um, enable components to be separately serviceable. Uh, in the Microsoft verse, this is, they are very explicit about this. Uh, they ship uh, individual components to be able to provide um, specific um, specific security patches for them. If you link against, if you link statically against a library, there is no way to patch it, to patch it externally by the library uh, vendor. If you link against the library dynamically, the vendor can uh, theoretically, uh, if you operate on Microsoft scale or you have the infrastructure to support it, the vendor can um, patch it with security patches or bug fixes. I mean, its development cycle is separate from that of the application. It's a separate component. Um, All right. No, I, I, like... I can think of other reasons. I'm sure I'm missing some, but... Um, oh, this was a great answer. Yeah, I, 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 so. <laughs> All right, thank you.